Hi there, this is Andrew Jones at Climate Interactive, and I was happy to see the experiments that Eric Rostin did in the En-ROADS simulator that you can see here in his recent Bloomberg Green piece in his newsletter. And I wanted to show you a couple things of what scenarios it created, how you could recreate them in En-ROADS, the free online simulator that we built with Climate Interactive and with MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative, and also some of the interesting graphs to see, assumptions you can change, some explanation of why you get the results that you do. So let's play with some of these uh, scenarios that I created. The main one was the new zero carbon electricity source. And the way you create that is you just click right here and you can see the growth of a new zero carbon electricity source. And I'll, we hit the replay button and you can see the orange area grow on top of coal and oil and, and gas and blue there and renewables, bioenergy and nuclear. You see it grow and importantly, you can see the other areas shrink. You can see less coal, oil and gas. How much? Well, look under here under primary energy demand for coal. You can see it succeeds at keeping coal in the ground, keeps coal emissions out of the atmosphere. It actually improves air pollution as well. So it succeeds at keeping some coal out of the air. Let's look at gas, natural gas, methane gas. Provide the test, you can, you can see how new zero carbon electricity crowds out some natural gas. It doesn't really address much in transportation without accompanying electrification, which we can test later. So it doesn't do much with oil. Oil demand doesn't change very much. We can, well, I'll just do it right now, why not? Well, <laughs> if we add in electrification, then they really work together well. That was a side note. Okay, back to the main test. If we have new zero carbon electricity, it succeeds at reducing carbon dioxide emissions you see them falling. You can see overall greenhouse gas emissions falling here in the 2040s. And then temperature drops 0.2 degrees from 3.6 to 3.4. This prompts the question, why? Why such a modest impact from this new supply? Well, we did give it a really good chance to grow. I'm going to look at what our assumptions were. We can see that it grows really quickly. It does take 10 years to commercialize. Then it shows up in the market 18% below the marginal price of coal. Let's look and see where that, that price is. Uh, if we look here under prices, you can see the cost of electricity. You can see the orange line showing up here in 2022 is the year I think it arrives, but it's 18% below the cost of coal and brown, and it drops to about 70% below following the economies of scale reinforcing loop, where every doubling of cumulative installed capacity of this new supply reduces the cost 20%. Price drops down, down, down. It is incredibly inexpensive. Why then doesn't it provide more of a benefit to the climate? And it does grow fast. I'll show you a few more statistics. This growth, uh, it grows 158 fold in its first 20 years after reaching one exajoule of supply. When comparison, nuclear power grew six fold in the first 20 years after it reached one exajoule. So it's not because it's not growing fast. It is because of three reasons. The three reasons are the first is just the delay. It is not until the 2040s that we really see this significant cut in greenhouse gas net emissions. And because it's not until the 2040s, we get that result that you saw quoted in the article where we looked at cumulative emissions. You can see that by 2050, it cuts it only modestly from there. Let's see, from this number, 3617 down here to 35. Four, nine. That is the only 7.5% of what's needed to get to net zero of the avoided cumulative emissions required. So it takes a long time. That's reason number one. 
Reason number two is it is eating into other zero carbon supplies and competing with other zero carbon supplies. Notice renewable final energy consumption is lower in this scenario. So we have zero carbon electricity eating into wind and solar and probably also into uranium. Let me, I haven't looked at the nuclear one. Oh, it's tough to see there. I'm gonna look at primary. Uh, does it eat into the nuclear? Yes, it is also competing with and crowding out nuclear. So those are two of the reasons. The third reason is the way it expands around the world so extensively is that it's very inexpensive. I'm gonna pull back up the emissions here again. It's very inexpensive. That's why it spreads around the world. If it's inexpensive, the overall cost of energy goes down and that erodes some of the incentive for energy efficiency, for conservation. Low prices lead to a little bit of a rebound effect, a little bit of a Jevons paradox, where the final energy consumption goes up a little bit, as Eric Rostin quoted in the article. That's the third reason that we see such a modest impact. Now, there are different changes that we could make to test this, different sensitivities that we may want to explore. I'm going to pull back up the uh, near zero carbon supply. One could imagine that instead of the breakthrough being in 2022, it could happen later this year. I don't know, this fall here in 2021, the commercialization time could be even less. Five years, the cost relative to coal could be even less. We could get a little more growth. We also could imagine a different assumption for the progress ratio. I mentioned the progress ratio at 0.8. That is uh, right here, the quote, let me see where the supply, excuse me, the references. We took this number from uh, Junginer et al., these studies here, but what if it's not 0.8, but the uh, improvement happens and uh, we have a 30% improvement with every doubling of carbon or 40%, maybe that would lead there to be faster growth. Still, this, conclusion seems robust to various assumptions. Okay, the second test that was done uh, really explores some of the role of carbon price. I think they mentioned a hundred dollars a ton carbon price. And I want to point out the contribution that it makes that's particularly important. I'm going to bring back the, uh, and it has to do with the timing of the effect. Eric Rostin quoted $100 a ton. Why is it effective? We'll see, there's a change to $100 a ton, bringing you from 3.6 all the way down to 3.0. And the key structural difference is the timing. If we assume there's a carbon price soon, it avoids emissions here in the 2020s and the 2030s. It helps sooner. We need to pay attention. When do we avoid emissions with various policies? Another policy that was explored was the role of afforestation. The best graphs to look at, I think, are these. I'm gonna reset the model. This graph on the right shows land use CO2 emissions, and then on top of it, energy CO2 emissions from burning coal, oil, and gas, F gases, methane, and N2O. Anything below the zero line will be removals. Over on the left are the totals of all those removals. I'm gonna to increase to the maximum of what we have here in the default, which is 700 million hectares devoted to afforestation. It leads to a removal of 6.4 gigatons of CO2 per year, but not until the 70s, 2070s or 2080s. It doesn't bring down the temperature in Celsius 0.1 degree. It does change the Fahrenheit I'll run it again and we'll watch that it brings it from 6.6 .6 Fahrenheit to 6.4 if we were to see that result. You can see land use CO2 goes from positive to a net uh, removal, a small area of removals there out in the second half of the century. Why? Why is this? Primarily because it takes so long, partly to plant the trees and find the land, but mostly it takes a long time for trees to grow and for photosynthesis to pull carbon out of the atmosphere into the trees and then into soils. Perhaps that time could be shorter. 
one could explore that instead of 10 years overall to find the land, it could be less. And that increased the uh, green area. Notice it, it hopped up sooner. I'll run it again. You notice here in the 2050s, it, it's doing a bit more. Maybe that the planting time is a little bit less. So maybe I'm going to decrease it down, not 30 years, but down to 10 years. That led there to be a little bit sooner removals from afforestation, but not enough to make a big difference on temperature. It's just way too delayed. Maybe there could be a lot more land. You could go and change the assumption for how much land there is. Get up to the point of a trillion trees here. Maximum land could be more, leading to a maximum removals of 11 gigatons. But that would be a lot of land. How much land? We calculated it. It's important to think about the effect on equity, the effect on people, food prices, who lives on this land right now. To think, how much does it add up to? This is all the land that would be required for the afforestation. You can see here the area of India. What is this? Two and a half or so Indias. This would be a lot of land. I'm going to remove those most optimistic assumptions. Send us back to where we were before. And then test the last test was to add technological carbon removal. I'm going to undo afforestation and then explore these five types of removal. Eric Rostin really moved the lever all the way here. This is incredibly optimistic for carbon dioxide removal in that there's no choice between all five of the types, between bioenergy, carbon capture and storage in purple, and between that and biochar, agricultural soil carbon, direct air capture and mineralization. This is saying, what if we enact all the policies and succeed with the middle point of what the Royal Society estimated could happen all five of them, not choosing between them. You know, it could be higher, it could be lower. If we explored these maximum carbon removal settings, we could increase or decrease or increase, but still what we're getting in this case would be 0.3 degrees. With afforestation, it would be more. The area under the zero line is that silver area, silver gray, is the total being removed, which is still relatively small compared to what's going into the atmosphere, which is above the line. There are important comparisons that would need to be made as well to the scale, of what we're really imagining here. One comparison that we did was to imagine if just for the mineralization, that's crushing rocks, spreading it on agricultural land, how much are we talking about? The silver line shows that it is about double the scale of current coal production in the billion tons bulk material moved per year. This is a very large industry to get that removal. You can also compare against how much land is required for farming that uses these techniques, a good bit of land for soil carbon in yellow, and then a lot of land for mineralization, again, compared to the area of India. Overall, there's a good bit of uh, support you can get if you want to try this simulator yourself. There is a support page. There's a training program. There are many other uses for En-ROADS and games and workshops that you can explore. Overall, we hope you can use it to make a big difference out there in the world. Bye-bye.